pronunciation. And the pronunciation is uh, po or it's very close when you say po, there's an aspirant on the end. If you remove the aspirant, the Chinese says the word for the spirit which rises. There are two spirits, the Han and the Po, and uh, at death they separate. This particular Chinese character is translated by D.T. Suzuki as simplicity, this Po, this Po. I have translated it as uncarved, because later in East Asian wisdom traditions, this particular character became the focus of the idea of the uncarved block, and later on became quite uh, famous in Japan in terms of a Zen quality. In Lao Tzu, it's not the uncarved block or the unbleached silk, but it is the simplicity, it is the uncarvedness that's there in the infant. In other words, all potentials are present, and anything can be developed, anything can come out. The notion of the uncarved block in Zen is that it is left alone. So that later in East Asian wisdom traditions, leaving simplicity alone was a hallmark of a certain kind of, I guess we would say, rustic philosophic perspective. But in Taoism, in the time of Lao Tzu, there was the sense of the protean possibilities. It is uncarved then as the infant is yet to begin exploring its possibilities. And if you remember, chapter 28, have the title, Resuming Uncarved. Resuming in the sense of coming back to and participating again in the uncarved. Or we should perhaps put a 17th century Elizabethan inflection on the last syllable, the uncarved. This was chapter 28 in my translation. Who knows itself masculine and keeps itself feminine becomes heaven earth's cleft. Being heaven earth's cleft, eternal te not left, regoes, returns to his beginning. Who knows itself's white and keeps itself black becomes heaven earth's measure. Being heaven earth's measure, eternal te, not masked, regoes, returns to non self. Who knows itself's glory? and keeps itself humility, becomes heaven-earth's indention. Being heaven-earth's indention, eternal te, then intact, regoes, returns to uncarved. Uncarved, readied, then beings a vessel spirit gem, utilizing this, then being official chief, and therefore great handling, not carve up. Now it's using English with a little bit of pyrotechnic. I'm using the English language to convey the kind of word play that is there in Lao Tzu. Now, we've talked many times of how 
every other section of the Tao Te Ching has a kind of a consonance. There's a correspondence. All the even ones correspond in a way. All the odd ones correspond in a way. So our first section tonight is chapter 30, which has a quality of being correspondent to resuming uncarved. Chapter 30, its title is, in my translation, Curtail Violence. Curtail Violence. And as we will see, Lao Tzu recognizes that there is a very great difficulty. There is a technical difficulty in dealing with violence. And so while chapter 30 is curtail violence, chapter 31 is quell violence. So there is a kind of a one-two step here. But we want to pay attention to these correspondent structures. The Taoist outlook is not Aristotelian. It does not look for cause and effect. It does not look for an argument to be engendered by having subject-object, by having predicates following, we want to understand that the correspondences make gestalts by resonance, by being together. So while chapter 30 and chapter 31 seem to follow, both deal with violence, one deals with the initial curtailing of it, so you can begin to deal with it more effectively, and chapter 31, then, is how to quell it to the point of extinction. Chapter 28, resuming uncarved, is correspondent with curtail violence. But what is correspondent to quelling violence, quelling by putting it out, is chapter 29. And the title of chapter 29 I left untranslated because we need to incorporate these Chinese terms just as we incorporated Tao, just as we incorporated Te, we need to incorporate these two characters, which are Wu Wei. Wu Wei. And chapter 29, Wu <coughs> Wei, had this kind of feeling tone here in my language, surging desire to take heaven, earth, and busy at it, I see itself not obtained. Thereby, heaven, earth, a divine vessel, not can be busy, indeed. Busy one mars it. Seizing one loses it. Therefore, of beings, some blaze, others glow, some breathe warm, others cool. Some strong, others weak. Some carry, others carry. Therefore, spirit gem abandons extravagance, abandons extrovertence, abandons indulgence. And so the Chapter 29, headed by Wu Wei, we would expect a metaphysical or perhaps even a mystical poem, an insight. And instead, we have this kind of a caution against going too far outside of a sense of balance. That balance itself has a shape but the kind of shape that is not made by definition, not made by boundaries. And therefore, the shape of balance is Wu Wei. There are no defined boundaries to Wu Wei, but the sense of balance. This is the chapter that is corresponded with quelling violence. To curtail violence is one thing. To put violence out is quite a different thing.
they are distinct activities. To curtail violence, one must be strategic. One must deal with the context. But to quell violence, one must be pragmatic and specific. And the pragmatic specificity is to have your equilibrium intact. And your equilibrium intact, if it is any shape which you are putting forth, which you are asserting, which you are projecting, then it is not te, but some mental version of your understanding of te. So Lao Tzu says that when te is intact, one has the indention of heaven and earth in oneself. What is that indention? It's like the fulcrum of equilibrium is turned inside out by acceptance. Instead of it being a fulcrum rising like the ego, to hold the balance on its pinnacle, the Taoist indention is like that inverted carrot that accepts whatever is to transpire. And this balance is one that is deeper. And in this balance, Te is intact, eternal. And since Te is intact, the fourth phase of the energy cycle will be intact also. Our balance will convey the fullness of Te, the power of Te, to our minds. And our minds not haunted by some need to have the world respond to the pinnacle of our power. Instead, we convey the intact te by our spirit gem, and the world settles into the shape that it really has. And our minds, ideas, and symbols, and images are consonant with that te. Then, Tao flowing through that Te, through our spirit gem, through that E of the minds, symbols, and ideas, makes that fifth phase of the energy cycle, the world of the 10,000 things. And since the world then has all of the keys of equilibrium, the world will return and re-go back to the Tao. And the ecology of the real will be intact. The circulation of the chi will be manifest. There will be no impediments to stop the circulation. So chapter 30, curtailing violence, is quite distinct from chapter 31, quelling violence. And here is how Chapter 30 is translated in Wing Sit Chan. This is his translation. Remember now, recall, that Wing Sit Chan is a very fine uh, Chinese professor, but he has a Neo-Confucian mind, which is tutored by the Japanese commentarial, um, early 20th century commentarial tradition, so Wing Sit Chan's mind is not balanced at all, even though he is Chinese. Even though he reads Chinese very well, he does not think in Lao Tzu's Chinese at all. So when he makes a translation, it comes through two distinct filters. One, a late Sun Neo-Confucianism, and two, an early 20th century Japanese. Now, this is how he translates Lao Tzu, who he thinks was just a made-up name of some kind of a committee in the Han Dynasty. So this is how he translates chapter 30. He who assists, he who assists the ruler with Tao does not dominate the world with force. The use of force usually brings requital. Whenever armies are stationed, Wherever they are stationed, briars and thorns grow. Great wars are always followed by famines. 
A good general achieves his purpose and stops, but dares not seek to dominate the world. He achieves his purpose, but does not brag about it. He achieves his purpose, but does not boast about it. He achieves his purpose, but is not proud of it. He achieves his purpose, but only as an unavoidable step. He achieves his purpose, but does not aim to dominate. For after things reach their prime, they begin to grow old, which means being contrary to Tao. Whatever is contrary to Tao will soon perish. Now it reads fluidly enough, and if one is not too circumspect, and if one is simply an undergraduate stu student uh, hoping for an A from the professor, you're not going to question too much. But on deeper experience and on more kaleidoscopic reflection, this translation will not do at all, for this is not what Lao Tzu says, nor is it the way in which he speaks. For Lao Tzu, what, which means old master, Lao Tzu, would never subscribe that uh, the things after they reach their prime they begin to grow old, which means being contrary to Tao. Being old is not contrary to Tao. Here's the translation that I have worked out. Keeping in mind that chapter 28, resuming on card, has a correspondence with this. Now the English is a little difficult because Lao Tzu's Chinese is difficult. He is putting language characters out in a spontaneity which requires of us to hear in a suspended mode and not force a syntax of argument upon the language prematurely. He wants the words to come out like musical notes, like perhaps musical notes played on a flute in a clear, um, ambient, echo echoless atmosphere, say like uh, the Taj Mahal with Paul Horn playing his flute. He wants these words, this language, to appear in mid-psychic air and to hang there, and that after a few such notes and words, we will begin to tune the timbre of our hearing and be able to accept in the indentation of our attendance to the whole a quality of the gestalt forming out of thin air. So instead of a language which seeks to make sense in an argument unfolding before you, this is a gestalt that appears finally out of the fall of the snowflakes of the meaning. Thereby, Tao does Jen's master, one not thereby weapons strengthens heaven, earth, itself's business makes good recompense. An army's placement occasions briars, thorns growing there, great war's consequence surely have bad harvests. High one, resolute, yet therewith not dares thereby taking by force. Resolute, yet never boastful. Resolute, yet never haughty. Resolute, yet never arrogant, resolute yet not 
occur therewith. Resolute yet, never violent. Things flourish, then decay. This is called knock down. Knock down fades therewith. Now this is very mystical. Chapter 30 is very mystical. He's allowing the language to ping upon our hearing or to impinge upon our seeing the sound of the characters. And we, if we can hold it suspended, watch the exchange of this word coming and now it's being replaced by this word or displaced by this word, this phrase coming, that phrase displacing it. And so the language is coming into a kind of an arena of our attention so that we are experiencing as we hear the language or as we see the language appearing we are conscious that this language is appearing before us and that the language itself has an ambidextrous kind of quality it both entertains and sweeps us up, but it also is making an illusion which we must be suspect about. When we are able to let the language forms occur and maintain our balance and let them occur within our balance so that we do not either endorse them nor repel them, but let them occur, we have gained, kinesthetically as it were, the very quality that curtails violence. By holding language lightly, we have engendered in, our, in ourselves that quality of person who can now curtail violence. For violence will not sweep us up or repel us away. It has lost its electric current for us. And so, towards the end, things flourish, then decay. This is called knockdown. Knockdown fades therewith. We are able not to take the not Tao, as it's called, into our minds as an object, but to hold it in suspension before us as just words, descriptive words. And those descriptive words will fade. Here is chapter 31, calling violence, which goes forward from 30, but is consonant with Wu Wei, chapter 29. I put both these chapters together because this is rather difficult. We're trying to learn a strategic use of language which a Taoist would uh, use. When the Chinese misused this Taoist technique and approach, the phrases fell into aphorisms which you would get on fortune cookies and things like that. Or you would get quoted at you by the literati. If the phrases, if the words fall all the way and become aphoristic, one has then objectivized the language and lost the dumb's flavor, which Lao Tzu is encouraging. He's encouraging us to let language hover before us. For if we can let it hover before us, it will also hover within us. And our minds, instead of being lined like concrete nests, fortified against those who disagree with us and do us in, our minds will hold in suspension all of the structures and when those internal structures are suspended, we are a long ways towards 
curtailing violence, because the only thing that curtails violence, the only thing that curtails violence is equilibrium of some. When Gandhi talks of non-violence, he does not use the term non-violence. He uses the term ahimsa. And ahimsa is related always to satyagraha. Satyagraha meaning grasping truth. How can you grasp truth? Certainly not with your hands. Certainly not with political power. Certainly not with the egotistical personality. How can you grasp truth? You can only grasp it in the sense of in complete equilibrium, recognizing it and being one with it. And when one has satyagraha working, ahimsa also occurs as a resonance in the world. The human being who grasps truth, the satyagrahi, by just being in the world, resonates like a bell, ahimsa. And nonviolence occurs in this world as a resonance, as an energy resonance from the equilibrium of the person who holds the language and thus the mind, and thus the tay of the world, in equilibrium, in the shape that has no boundary. So here is chapter 31, quelling violence, correspondent with Wu Wei. And you can see we are now becoming a little more mystical. We're getting towards the close of the section of the day. And this is very, very powerful, Chinese classic, mystical insight into how one does this. For violence and rage, anger, these are perennial problems for human beings. Chapter 31, Quelling of Violence. Even wonderful weapons, not beatific as tools, all like awful as therefore having town, one not dwells on them. Circumspect philosophers at home value the heart sign. Using weapons value the power sign. Weapons themselves not beatific as tools. No way the circumspect philosopher's tools not occur with them, yet uses their functions. Peace, pacific doings, high heralded yet not enjoyed, yet enjoyed it this one likes to kill Jen. Now, when likes to kill Jen, one then not can thereby occur purposefully in heaven earth. Eh? In energized events, honor the heart sign. In ending events, honor the power sign. Assisting generals sit in the heart side. Generally, sit in the power side. Meaning to hold the highest position, then, thereby make a funeral ceremony of it. To kill gen multitudes, many thereby sorrows griefs, weeping itself. War victory thereby as funeral ceremony. 
treated in itself. Uh, this is very difficult. It's extremely difficult. If one were to say, well, what is the gist of what Lao Tzu is saying? By reducing it down to the gist, we're going to miss it. If we boil this down, what is it that he's saying? We will miss what he's saying. Because there's a very beautiful quality of suspending the language and letting it have this kind of play. It's like a great art mobile. In order to see the mobile and all of its possibilities, it must move, or you must move by walking around it, because there are many different qualities of relationality. To have a photograph only a two-dimensional photograph of a hanging mobile does injustice to the form. The same thing here. By trying to extract the ideas, what is Lao Tzu talking about, from the mystical way in which he talks, distorts it. Now, here's a translation. This is the translation by Hendricks of chapter 31. Let's see how he does. And in saying that, when we say, let's see how he does, notice that if he makes sense right away in the first reading, he has missed it. And we are misled, and we will miss it too. Because you have to live with the language of Lanzer for a long while and get used to its play. For he is not presenting any shapes that have defined boundaries at all. So if you see shapes that have defined boundaries in his language, you have made those up yourself. They are not there in Lao And one is not a Taoist. One is then more like the Chinese civil servants of the Han Dynasty, who would argue over the ideas of what he said, just like graduate students have in turn. <laughs> if you have a poem by Shelley, Hymn to Intellectual Beauty, and you turn that over to graduate students anywhere in the world at any time, they will mince up the poem and come out with colossal ideas that have nothing to do with Shelley's poem. And you will never hear any one of them simply stop talking about the ideas and simply recite the poem again, which is the only intelligent avenue, really, to take in poetry. There is the poem, and that's it. So the same in Lao Tzu. Here's how Hendrix takes chapter 31. As for weapons, they are instruments of ill omen. And among things, there are those who that hate them. Therefore, the one who has the way with them does not dwell. When the gentleman is at home, he honors the left. When at war, he honors the right. Therefore, weapons are not the instrument of the gentleman. Weapons are instruments of ill omen. When you have no choice but to use them, it's best to remain tranquil and calm. You should never look upon them as things of beauty. If you see them as beautiful things, this is to delight in the killing of men. And when you delight in the killing of men, you'll not realize your goal in the land. Therefore, in happy events, we honor the left. But in mourning, we honor the right. Therefore, the lieutenant general stands on the left, and the supreme general stands on the right. When multitudes of people are killed, we stand before them in sorrow and grief. When we're victorious in battle, we treat the occasion like a funeral ceremony. 
All right, this is the way that Hendrix translates it. Here's how Winsett Chan translates the same thing. Notice the similarities. Winsett Chan comes about, um, oh, I would say two generations before Hendrix. So Hendrix would have read Winsett Chan as a graduate student, for instance. Fine weapons are instruments of evil. They are hated by men. Therefore, those who possess Tao turn away from them. The good ruler, when at home, honors the left. When at war, he honors the right. Weapons are instruments of evil, not the instruments of a good ruler. When he uses them unavoidably, he regards calm restraint as the best principle. Now let's stop here. And let's just bring out some reflection here. Not many of us have had the opportunity to use hand weapons, I mean, other than, say, guns or bazookas or mortars or something. But if you've ever held a sword or used a sword in swordsmanship, and not, I don't mean a foil, I mean a sword, the weight of a sword in battle is roughly around 20 pounds or so is a real heft. You can't be delicate picking up a sword. One of the great scenes in a Shakespearean drama of Richard had him swing his sword down on a narrow iron bar and cleft that bar in twain. And in response, the wise Saladin said, it is not the sharpness of the English sword, but the power of the arm. And he had a silk veil thrown in the air. He simply held his scimitar out, and the silk split on the scimitar. He said, while the English arm is strong, my blade is sharp. When Lao Tzu talks about left and right, he's talking about the physiological person here. He's not talking about the left side so much as the side that is on the heart side person. He's talking about the right side, but he's talking about the power side in the sense that this is where you would use the weapon. This is the weapon side. He's not saying that when you go out into a battle that one be delicate about the etiquette of swordplay. You don't wait for the camera to get in the right action and you clang the sword. You're not trying to hit the other sword to make beautiful clanging dramatic sounds. You're trying to lock off the arm of your opponent. So when Winset Chan says, Weapons are instruments of evil, not the instruments of a good ruler. When he uses them unavoidably, he regards calm restraint as the best principle. You can't use calm restraint in a sword fight. It's not going to work. You're going to be carved up, to use a little pun, in what we're dealing with behind the scenes here. When he says, for to praise victory is to delight in the slaughter of men. He who delights in the slaughter of men will not succeed in the empire. He's saying that if one goes completely to leaning on the power of the sword to make the kingdom, that this will not last. In auspicious affairs, the left is honored, in, auspi in auspicious affairs, the right is honored. The lieutenant general stands on the left, the senior general stands on the right. It's very similar in Hendricks. He's following when he said Chan, actually. For, a, for the slaughter of the multitude, let us weep with sorrow and grief. For a victory, let us observe the occasion with funeral ceremony. 
Now this is not quite it at all. One does not observe this occasion with funeral ceremonies. Lao Tzu is talking about quelling violence, quelling violence in us. There's nothing in Hendrix or Wing Set Chan about extinguishing violence. It's good advice about how to pay attention to the fact that there are polarities, but it doesn't go much further than that. There's no mystical sense of the boundless shape of the equilibrium of Te and its intactness indenting in our acceptance. When D.T. Suzuki made his translation of this particular chapter, long before Wing Sit Chan did, almost a century before Hendrix did, here's how he translated chapter 31, his pithy little translation done in 1898. Even beautiful arms are unblessed among tools, and people had better shun them. Therefore, he who has reason does not rely on them. The superior man, when residing at home, honors the left. When using arms, he honors the right. Arms are unblessed among tools, and not the superior man's tool. Only when it is unavoidable, he uses them. Peace and quietude he holds high. He conquers, but rejoices not. Rejoicing at a conquest means to enjoy the slaughter of men. He who enjoys the slaughter of men will most assuredly not obtain his will in the empire. I'm stressing you, stretching you, and stressing you a little bit. But what's coming into play here in Lao Tzu's language are not these advices and not the reductive ideas. His language suspended in a displacing kaleidoscope of occurrence, is testing to see whether he who or she who is hearing, or she or he who is reading, is balancing, balancing this language. If you are balancing the language, you are not interested in getting the idea. You are not interested in receiving or giving advice. You're balancing the language so that the boundless shape of equanimity is occurring. If that is occurring, all violence has been quelled. If you try to quell violence as an object, the more you struggle with it's like the tar baby, the worse it becomes. The worst of one's nature comes out when you try to be really good. And you really try. And just every little thing interrupts your real trying to be good, and it's just too much. How dare they interrupt you? All these things that come up. So that by addressing one's energy objectively to a task, especially such an important task, is getting rid of violence. The more you fight to get rid of violence, the more that violence becomes characteristic of your outlook. And Lao Tzu says that this is the delight in the killing of men. Because one can delight in the killing without actually running them through with a sword, just that their things are not working out for them. Oh, good. They're not really enjoying their life. They're not really having equanimity. So here's Lanzu's language one more time. Chapter 31, Quelling Violence. Then we'll take a break. Even wonderful weapons, not beatific as tools, all alike awful, as therefore having Tao, one not dwells with them. 
circumspect philosopher at home values the heart side. Using weapons values the power side. Weapons themselves, not beatific, as tools. No way the circumspect philosopher's tools. Peace, pacific doings, high heralded, yet not enjoyed. Yet enjoyed it, this one likes to kill, Jem. Now when likes to kill, Jem, one then not can thereby occur purposefully in heaven earth. And in energized events, honor the heart sign. In ending events, honor the power sign. Assisting generals sit in the heart sign. Generaling sit in the power sign meaning to hold the highest position then, thereby make a funeral ceremony of it, to kill gen multitudes, many thereby sorrows, griefs, weeping itself, war victory thereby as funeral ceremony treated in itself. Let's take a break. And we'll I thought we need to have some comparisons, and this is this is pretty good. DC Lao. This is the Penguin Classics translation, and uh, this is published by Hong Kong uh, University Press. In the hardcover. And if you get interested, the original order before 250 BC at the top of Ching is here, and somebody can make a Xerox of this. Let's come back to chapter 28. We used chapter 28 tonight as a touchstone. The touchstone is a kind of a pleasant way of talking about um, an alchemical quality. The original touchstone was a lodestone. And the property alchemically of a lodestone was that it had invisible resonances. It was magnetic. So that in the ancient wisdom tradition, the magus moved by magnetic resonance. And so his language syntax was always styled to be consonant with the real, so that the correspondences would occur, so that when he would say, Mars, the influence of Mars would be in the word. And so the amulet for such a magical language moving by magnetic resonance comes from the high medieval abracadabra, a language which tunes one's ability to speak resonantly. So that the difference was the difference between poetry and shop talk. Someone who just talks shop talk will never understand anything important. For in trying to seize by their shop talk way of talking anything of value, they destroy it, they mar it. It recedes before them as quickly as they approach, and they never see it. This lodestone this touchstone that chapter 28 is for us tonight is something that all of our presentation tonight is resonant from. 
And the title of 28, Resuming Uncarved. Resuming Uncarved. And recall now that the uncarved is not like the sophomoric uncarved block. So that if someone put out some kind of lump of wood, one would say, well, this is wonderful because it's uncarved. It's not that at all. D.C. Lau on chapter in on page 183 says, referring to chapter 28, in chapter 28 we have, and he translates the Chinese line, when the uncarved block shatters, it becomes vessels. The sage makes use of these and becomes the lord over the officials. This passage seems to say that when the uncarved block shatters, it becomes vessels. A vessel is a specialist who is only fitted to be an official. Hence, the sage, when he makes use of these vessels, becomes the lord over the officials. The Ma Wan Tui text does not, however, have the particle chi after yun and reads, when the uncarved block shattered, it becomes vessels. When the sage is employed, he becomes the chief of the officials. The meaning is very different. The uncarved block is a symbol for the sage. Just as the uncarved block becomes vessels when it shatters, so does the sage become the chief of the officials when he allows himself to be employed. And just as the uncarved block is ruined when it becomes useful, so does the sage become ruined when he becomes useful. Now this sounds very wise, and it's actually tangential to Lanzer. For one thing, there's no magnetic poetry in this. If you shatter something, you have shards. Whereas something which vibrates, all of the vibratory qualities are there, but untouched is the lodestone. Untouched is the uncarved block. So if the sage does not move by shattering the uncarved block, when the uncarved block shatters, it becomes vessels, the sage makes use of these and becomes lord of the officials. That most surely is not at all Taoist. Even the emendation, when the uncarved block shattered, it becomes vessels, when the sage is employed, he becomes the chief of the officials. That's not it either. One has to think here, if you cannot think in terms of the magnetic qualities of a magnet, like a lodestone. And incidentally, this was uh, ill understood, the first description of the exact movement of energy in a magnet was done in Shakespeare's time by a man named Gilbert. And Gilbert's book, De Magnetati, is one of the first times that anyone ever really understood what was happening. And from Gilbert's De Magnetati to Franklin's book on electricity, there really was no advance at all. And it wasn't until a hundred years ago only that James Cook Maxwell finally understood how one could expressively talk about what a magnetic field really is. And in doing so, one has to talk about the electromagnetic field. All of this would carry us far away if it were not to serve to remind us that we're dealing here with resonance and not with pieces. The uncarved block never shatters. The sage never impersonates roles and then is useful because he can impersonate many roles. 
This is not him at all. The Taoist sage is not a jack of all trades. He does by maintaining a boundless shapedness to his gen, so that his gen is spirit gen. The third phase of the energy cycle is completely accepting. And because it is completely accepting, he is constant with Tao, and Tinny moves through him in such a way that there's no impedance on the Tay whatsoever. So that when a Taoist sage has an idea, the idea has all of the power of all Tay. His idea is not carved out of the mind based upon the world. It's not an imitation, a limited Im imitation of the world. It's not a picture limited to the cranium, which is just an imitation of the world, so that the veracity of the thing is out in the world, and it's only an imitation that's in one's head, and just a small little imitation that's in one's head, and the big real thing is out there in the world. That's not it at all. Not at all. That's like someone who is just um, getting by in life. But the sage, when the sage has an idea in his mind, that idea has all the tay that there is. So that when that idea works, it doesn't just produce the 10,000 things, but the idea is consonant with Tao. In a very real way, the power of the mind of the sage is consonant with the te and consonant with the phase that the 10,000 things folds back into, which is the Tao. So there's a very odd kind of situation here. Let's look at the five phase energy cycle by holding up a hand. The Tao in the first phase is the thumb. The te is the pointing finger. The middle finger is the gem, or spirit gem it can be, can be deepened. The ideas, the e, are in the fourth phase, and the li in the fifth phase, the 10,000 things. Now the correspondence of consonants is always every other one, grandfather phasing or grandmother phasing. If spirit gen is pure, it is totally consonant with Tao. So that someone who is manifesting no particular bounded shape at all will manifest Tao. That's all that there is. There is nothing else. And by manifesting Tao in the third phase, by being down, here now, the Te in between works through that person in a universal way. It doesn't have to filter itself through an ego. It doesn't have to condense itself down, reduce itself down, but it moves with 100% efficiency as it is, so that the mind of the sage when the mind thinks of symbols, thinks of ideas, they have all the power that there is. Not just a little power, not just the neuronal power of this particular biological, neuro, psycho, physical energy, but all the power that there is. So that though that mind is correspondent with the Te, just as the person is correspondent with the Tao. The world becomes correspondent with the sage and the Tao 
And the short form of this is the landscape painting, which shows the wild world just as it is, the little figure of the sage wandering, and the Tao is there with them both. So the Tao, the sage, and the natural world, nature qua nature, untampered with. Nature is an uncarved block, the sage is an uncarved block, Tao as Tao, are all consonant together. Three. Notice here that te and the mind are consonant. And what would be the third correspondence? It would be beyond this, but there is no sixth phase. That would be chaos. It's the Tao itself again. So that the te and the mind of the sage are also consonant with Tao. Now look what's happening. Spirit gen is consonant with Tao, and the mind is also consonant with Tao, so that some really deep alchemical transformation happens. The human being who, bringing his or her holiness into play, the sacredness of no boundary shapedness, experiences, not only in their spirit gem, Tao, but in their mind, Tao also, in this other correspondence. And when one's mind and one's existentiality come together, they come together, the alchemical term is they anneal. And when they anneal, they become deeper than one. It's like this eye sees a certain image, this eye sees a certain image, but when stereoptically both eyes see together, the image becomes like three-dimensional. Here, the spirit gen and the mind come together and they become multi-dimensional. They become kaleidoscopic. And the Taoist term for such a person is no longer spirit gen, but shen. An eternal spirit. An eternal spirit who is conscious. Because there is no differentiation of the mind or the being. So when we hear <coughs> wonderful translation, seemingly, but finally suspect, he translates, when the uncarved block shattered, it becomes vessels, when the sage is employed, he becomes the chief of the officials. Not so. Lao Tzu uses language in this way. Who knows itself's glory and keeps itself's humility becomes heaven, earth's indention. Being heaven, earth's indention Eternal te then intact. Regos returns to uncarved, uncarved, readied, then beings a vessel. Spirit gem utilizes this, then being, quote, official chief. Therefore, great handling, not karma. Lao Tzu is saying something mystical here in an alchemical form. The Confucians and the Neo-Confucians and the Japanese critical Zen people never understood alchemy. There is no alchemy whatsoever. There is no alchemy in Zen. There is no alchemy in Confucianism. There is no alchemy in later Chinese thought. The alchemists are bogus. But in Lao in Taoism, in the original Chinese genius, the whole process is alchemical, which moves by transformation. Transformation, changing shape. How do you change shape? 
It's not that one displaces another anymore, but it's that one becomes shapeless in the sense that there are no boundaries. And in that dimension, everything is possible. There is nothing that is impossible. When we come to chapter 31, or 33 rather, the last one, the fourth one tonight, that's what talks about differentiate. It would be paradoxical if you were a Confucian trying to work these two words together. Differentiate. Does it mean oneness? How do you differentiate oneness? Well, you can't split them in a normal way. How do they split? Let's go back to our load stone. Let's go back to chapter 28. Let's go back to resuming uncarved, and let's get sort of like a key. We're going to get a, a Taoist key. Suzanne Liner wrote a wonderful book called Philosophy and a New Key. She said very often, thinking is an elaboration of feeling. So that if you have the feeling primordially, the resonance in thought will be very, very clear because it will be of the same structure. Even a good diehard physicist like Helmholtz knew that if you struck a bell, every sound wave would have a bell shape. <laughs> it's, that's the way things are. And if you could hear the infinite resonating bell-shaped sounds, you would hear bell into infinity. Whereas you try to keep the idea of a bell, the sound of a bell in your mind, you can't keep it very long. How long can you remember the sound of a bell accurately? Five minutes? A day? A week? Actually, in about two or three seconds, the fading of a mental image of the sound of a bell is already so far gone that it's very, very hard to retrieve it. And what you retrieve instead is a, uh, is a model of it, uh, which, which has as an index um, a pastiche of the Whereas, when you experience, in the Taoist way, it's indelible. Now, it's not completely uh, a refined, effete rarity. It happens all the time. If I say to you, think of an orange, you will all more or less struggle to think of an orange. But if I say, taste orange, there it is. And as soon as one goes to the experience, as soon as one goes to any part of a lived experience, the whole dimension of who you are shines forth. I mean the whole investigation of Marcel Proust, a la Recherche du Temps The whole investigation of that is that by bringing back the memory, which is the elaboration in the mind of the experience, one recaptures the past forever. Virginia Woolf called it an eternal moment. That is the gift of art. And that once one knows that you can do this even for one moment, the cap is out of the bag, the secret is loose. You could do this indefinitely, and you could find that experience of yourself that could bring back the eternal veracity of who you are before you were even ever in the form of primates on this particular planet. Then you would have something like the beyond Zen language of Noel Stevens, who says, the good man has no shape, and they all agree as if they knew. 
Here's 33. Differentiate t. Knowing, then, one is knowledgeable. Yourself knowing what is bright. Conquering, Jen, one has strength. Yourself conquering, one is forceful. Knowing fulfillment, one is wealthy. Forceful acting, one has will. Not losing your phase, one lasts. Dies yet not perishes. One has long lived. And the Chinese symbol in Taoist thought that brings us up is the peach. <clears throat> the peach. And very often it's like an old man with a high forehead, almost like a peach skull. A peach cream. And the peach comes into play early in the Han Dynasty, in the reign of Han Wu Ti, about, uh, oh, about 90 BC. The mystical queen mother of the West, the Persian woman, is fabled to have the secret of immortality in her garden. She has a plant growing in her garden which confers immortality. And in the reign of Han Wuji, the Chinese Empire, the Han Empire extended far enough that it finally went contiguous with ancient Persia. And in the Taoist myth, the Queen Mother of the West was brought to meet Han Wuji. And she brought with her a small dwarf version of the peach tree and said, I have heard that you value immortality. Here is the vehicle. You may plant this peach tree. And when the fruit ripens and you eat of it, you will become immortal. But the tree only blossoms once every 3,000 years. And it just finished blossoming. And Han Wu Ji <laughs> is the is the progenitor of, the, of this whole symbol. But there's a kind of a <coughs> folk nostalgia in the fact that you've got to you've got to keep the peaches for a long time before they do you any good. Later on, in the fifth century AD, the Taoist mythological story rendition of this passed on to a Taoist sage named um, um, uh, Chen Deng Lin, who told his disciples, now that you have finished years of preparation, all of the philosophy, you are ready for the final step of immortality. And he led them to this cliff. And they looked over the cliff, and there down below, growing out of the cliff, was a peach tree. And he said, if you will just go down there and bring me one of those peaches, I will then confer upon you immortality. And they said, well, it's several thousand feet. And the peach tree is maybe 50 feet below us, and it's a sheer cliff. How can we do this? It's impossible. Except that one disciple finally figured out that there is one way, and one way only. And he leapt over the side of the cliff and plunged down and grabbed hold of the tree and bounced there. And then in the tree, threw the peach up. And Shun Jing Ling took the peach and said, alone of all the students, this one is deserving of immortality. And using Tao's magic, he stretched his arm way down, grabbed the student, and pulled it off. <laughs> Transformation. The magical world. 
that the bounds of time-space are no longer the shapes, the bounds of what is possible. The boundless now is what is possible. So in differentiating Ted, chapter 33, if you know Jen, then one becomes knowledgeable. If you know something, you become knowledgeable about it. But if you're self-reflective, if the reflexive quality of consciousness comes upon the knower, your self-knowing, then one is bright. The term is Ming. Sometimes it's translated as enlightenment. In Lao Tzu, it doesn't mean enlightenment. It means bright. One is then bright in, in the sense that you now understand about you. Not about yourself, but you understand yourself. Not knowing about something, but the knowing that you have. Conquering Jen, one has strength. Yourself conquering, one is forceful. One is then forceful. One has that own, one has that quality of thusness. Or as the Taoist would say in Lao Tzu's time, Zijian, self soundness Knowing fulfillment, one is wealthy. Forceful acting, one has will. Not losing your phase, one lasts. Dies, yet not perishes. One is long lived. Sometimes you can translate it as immortal, and it can be that. Later on, after the Han Dynasty, the characters were translated as immortality. One becomes immortal. I don't do this because uh, it isn't so much immortality, but there's an eternal quality that's here. The Buddhist quality, when it came into China and mixed with Taoism, X'd out of uh, the eternal for something which was ineffable like nirvana. The Dawa sense was never nirvana. The Chinese sense of wisdom is not extinction, it's not moksha, it's not nirvana. The Chinese sense is very much like the ancient Egyptian sense. Eternal in the sense that one can return every day from here on out, forever. So the Chinese, like the Egyptian, the Taoist, like the Hermetic tradition, share not only the notion of alchemical transformation, which is at the fulcrum of human life. Life works by transformation. If you eat the peach, if your body can't transform the peach, you can't live by it. Life works by transformation. So that alchemy is the science of life. And both the Hermetic and the Taoist traditions develop alchemy and also develop the experience of the eternal. And one does not find this in the Buddhist uh, uh, quality. One does not find this in Judaism. The Hindu is a little bit different from the Buddhist in this, but still is not uh, does not have this eternal quality. But the Chinese and the Egyptian have it. And the eternal is always consonant with the transformation. The transformation is what manifests the eternal in one. So that this quality in Lao when we come to 34, 35, 36, 37, the last four chapters, when we come to 34, D.T. Suzuki translates the title of chapter 34 with these phrase, trust in its perfection. Trust in its perfection. 
Or to put it succinctly, trust perfection. Trust perfection. It's like the disciple who must leap over the edge and fall onto the tree with no thought of coming back, no thought of returning. Only that person will return because of a transformation that happens that could not be foreseen, could not be thought out, could not be planned. I think it was said once, only he who is going to lose his life gains life eternal. And so there's this secret, this uncanny secret of transformation and eternal. They go together like yin and yang. When Buddhism came into play from the second century AD on in China, Buddhism modified down so much that by the fourth or fifth century you had a whole different understanding. You had an amalgam of the two. And it took the Chinese experience about 300 years to absorb enough Buddhism into their Tao so that Buddhism could then be expressed in a complete Chinese Tao's way, which was done in the Platform Sutra of the Sixth Patriarch, Huing Ning, about 630 AD. He is no longer a Buddhist speaking, but he's a Taoist who has understood Buddhism in a Taoist way and expresses it that way. So that the first thing that the sixth patriarch, who was the last patriarch, in other words, there was no more lineage after him. Why? Why were there why was there no seventh patriarch? There were twenty-eight patriarchs in India and six patriarchs in China, and when one got to the sixth patriarch, when Buddhism became understood in a Taoist way, why was there no seventh? Because the sixth patriarch made himself like a lodestone and sent like a radio broadcast throughout all time space and anyone who ever wanted to could tune in and you would be the seventh patriarch at any time, any place. And in order to show the perfective contemplative power of the eternal quality in man the sixth patriarch, when it came time for him to let his life go, used his meditative powers and petrified his physiological body. He turned it into the consistency of anthracite coal. And that physical body of the sixth patriarch that was petrified about 1300 years ago is still in its temple in China. And Joseph Needham, when he was researching science and civilization in China, the master of Keyes College, uh, Cambridge in England, took a photograph, and it's there, of Queen Nick's body, still there in that same high yoga position, showing demonstratively that transformation and eternal eternality go together. And the body will last as long as stones on the planet will last. How long will a lump of anthracite coal last in nature? Hundreds and hundreds of millions of years. Next week will be the last week. If there are any friends of yours who are interested, it will be the last public lecture that I'll ever give, except for the Saturday course. So. Thank you.